started the recording. So yes, Jan, is we are recording. ready to go ahead and get started. Sounds good. If for any reason we experience technical difficulties like a lag in internet speed, if a video freezes or you just can't hear me, um, feel free to reach out and our host will let me know. Uh, and, and definitely you can just always yell at me as I mentioned before, uh, Kristen, that would be totally fine. Okay, so I am an outreach biologist and my focus is non-native fish and wildlife. But what does that really mean? I'm not going out in the field. My role is education and outreach. And because of that, I'm very blessed and lucky because you can see my um, fuzzed out informal setting. I am working from home today and I hope you have that luxury too. So please feel free to keep that informal spirit coming. So if you have questions and you wanna drop those in the chat Q and A, uh, I am happy to answer those, even questions that don't come up, or, or sorry, topics that don't come up necessarily in my slides. If it's non-native fish and wildlife related, I will do my very best to answer any questions you have. And I love getting to talk to you in that manner virtually. So let's dive into an overview, like high level of what's going on in Florida. And then I really wanna get more into the do's and don'ts. And I don't want it to be so structured, I wanna give you an idea of the challenges that we face, we meaning the non-native program, the fish and wildlife program within FWC, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Gosh, it's a mouthful. I wanna give you an idea of what challenges we face, especially in my outreach wing of how do we message this? How do we get the public involved? How do we get the public to stop doing something? Those are the tasks that fall into my wheelhouse. So let me give you a high level overview of what's going on. First, let's make sure that you that I acquaint you with some of the many terms that are out there. There's native, exotic, there's invasive, there's non-native. What does all this mean? Let's stick to three for the purposes of this presentation and kind of trying to digest the problem in Florida. It's okay to admit Florida has a problem with non-native species. Let's talk about it. First of all, what's a native species? Well, it's naturally occurring. That's, the, that's pretty straightforward. It didn't need any mechanism. It didn't need, need any help from humans to naturally occur in this environment. So we're talking about the whole state of Florida and all the habitats within. And the pictures here represent avian, reptilian, mammalian species. We've got a wide variety that are naturally occurring and they have, and I love this phrase, intrinsic value in our ecosystem. So even some of our Florida residents can be a little prickly about alligators. The American alligator is a native species to Florida. It has intrinsic value. Um, they can be nuisance animals, but that's very different than what's a non-native or an invasive species. So keep all of that digesting in the brain. Let's go over and I literally mean over to the other side of the screen. Let's talk about non-native species. And I removed the native species because sometimes, not all times, a non-native species may have an impact to a native species. And you never want to risk the existence of a native just to preserve a non-native. That's counterintuitive. So let's talk about what we've got here. Clearly on my slide, I don't have that much taxonomic diversity. What we've got in Florida is a high number of reptile non-native species and some fish species. There are other uh, non-natives, there are non-native birds, there are non-native mammals that are also present in the state and traded in the state. This is just a small representation and shouldn't be considered inclusive of everything that's out there. When we get a problem is when a non-native species gets introduced into the environment. So just because it's been imported doesn't mean it's been introduced. Introduced happens through accidental escape or intentional release then that non-native species can, it may go invasive. What qualifies a non-native as an invasive? That is the big question. It means for my agency, we define that as an adverse impact. The species itself has the potential to adversely impact the ecology, economy, or human health and safety. Well, human health and safety is pretty straightforward. It can bite me, it can transmit stuff to me, it can harm my pet, okay. 
economy and ecology are a little bit more nebulous to define. Ecology is literally, literally our wildlife and habitats, and economy is more of our tax dollars, our infrastructure, what we may spend repairing damage, um, the trade, the, um, not the trade, what do I mean? Agriculture, tourism, all of those can be in, impacted by an invasive species. Let's move on. What numbers are we talking about? Is there really a problem? And if you didn't already know, and I bet most of you are aware, Florida has a serious non-native species problem. If you look at that map, that is accurate. There are observations represented by each yellow data point. They are from 1924 until now, and many of them overlap. So there's more data on that map than you can possibly even imagine. And it doesn't even include all marine species. So it doesn't include lionfish. What you're looking at is well over 123,000 individual observations of non-native fish and wildlife. That's freshwater and terrestrial species. What does that mean? If I break down those, that's individual sightings. So I saw an iguana, I saw this, I saw that. If I break that down, what does that mean? How many species, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of species of fish and wildlife that are not naturally occurring and may present a problem to our state? at least 139 of those species are known to be reproducing. So what does that mean? In the documented peer reviewed scientific literature, there is evidence noted by scientists that at least 139 of these species are reproducing. Well, let's break that down. That means they have a foothold, they're able to thrive, at least survive, Let, let's qualify it that way. Species are able to survive in our ecosystem and especially in our South Florida subtropical climate, they're able to survive. Okay, well, maybe nature will just take its course and then they'll die off. Mm. When they're reproducing, they're able to reproduce and increase population numbers. That could be range, that could be density, that could be abundance, that could be a variety of scientific factors that land managers will look at and say, uh-oh, something's happening in the ecosystem. I can see the trend and this could be a problem. So it doesn't sound like a high number, 139 species. It is, it really is. This is, this is the ones that we, these are the ones that we know about. There could be way more. Let's use lionfish an example since they're not represented on this map, but they are a success story in a way. Let's talk about their story of being introduced and becoming an invasive species and then what we've done. I love telling this story. So let's look. Back in 1985, when Jan was using Aquanet hairspray to tease her bangs in the 1980s style, yes, I did that. Back in 85, what you see on this map was the lionfish representation. The introductions apparently happened off the coast of Florida, Palm Beach, Browardish area, those counties. The introductions happened, it was less than a handful, just a couple of individuals, and that's all it took. Fast forward a couple decades, just a couple of decades. Let's look at 2020. This is the lionfish invasion. A handful of non-natives, oh, I get goosebumps every time I talk about it. It's scary, really. A handful of non-native species had this level of impact. Why? Because the non-native lionfish had no natural predators in the Florida waters. It does in its home range in the Indo-Pacific. It had an abundance of food. It's gobbling up all of our native marine species. There's not the balance in the ecosystem here in its introduced range as there is in the Indo-Pacific range that it's its home range. So anytime an introduced species is able to thrive, it may be able to establish and then have an impact on our native species. Let's move on. When we're talking about how do they get introduced, we're talking about pathways, and this applies to you and me. We, as members of the general public, and as members who are focused on science, want to be aware of these pathways. There's the unintentional, the oops, accidental, I didn't mean for it to happen, but it happened anyway. And then there's the intentional, the escape. So let's talk about the first one. There are examples of this shipments, cargo ships regularly take in ballast. Ballast water helps with the weight distribution of the ship. 
And that water can be taken in in one port. The ship travels across the ocean. That water can be released in another port. That's how we get a lot of invasive species of mussels and other organisms. Cargo shipments can be terrestrial, like plants, um, agricultural, firewood, things like that. It can be goods that may have organisms within the the goods themselves, or they may just happen to fall into the containers of those goods. So this is why we have a, uh, a problem in Florida because we have several ports of entry. So those ports need a high, high amount of oversight. And it's understandable that something might be able to sneak through accidentally like the Indian mongoose that you see pictured here. This is one of two mongoose that were uh, detected. One of them was from a sugar shipment in the Caribbean and was detected in Port Everglades. And so this little guy is one of the invasive, most, sorry, most invasive mammal species in the world, commonly introduced into sugar plantations way back in the day and has wreaked havoc on native species in South America, in um, Pacific Islands. Oh gosh, Google the mongoose if you don't know about it. It's amazing what this critter has been able to do. So he got uh, a ticket to not stay in Florida, unfortunately, and was lethally removed. The intentional importation, this is tricky. This is a, an uncomfortable topic sometimes for us because not all live animal trade is bad or negative, but oversight is needed because from that literature review, we know for a fact that the most common introduction pathway is not the accidental hitchhiking like the mongoose. It is the accidental escape or intentional release of non-native animals from the live animal trade. So either the individual's caging was not up to snuff and an oops, accidental escape happens. That's not okay, that needs oversight. That's why we have regulations and that's why we have inspections for captive wildlife in our state. The other is that someone is suddenly unable to care for or just doesn't want to care for that species anymore and dumps it. So these are problems that we have to focus on as an agency. These introduction pathways, oh, excuse me, double slide. I'm sorry, I meant to hide this one. I had reworked it and forgot to hide it. These are examples of the introduction pathways. This escape or release is a big deal. And if we wait to see if something is a problem, then we risk a species getting introduced like whatever was in that tank. Or for example, the Burmese Python picture here, we can't be reactive. We must be proactive to any species that poses a risk to Florida. When we talk about where these species are coming from, let me give you the stats of that literature review I was talking about. Let's break down these numbers for you. Let's just focus on reptiles. I mentioned before that Florida has a high number of non-native reptiles that have been introduced. Here's the number. What do I mean? I mean of 180 species. That's a minimum. That's probably not every species. That's the ones that we know about. Reptilian species, 180. Of those introduced, recorded introduced in Florida, 92% of those came from the trade. Okay, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. If we look at the total, you add up all these taxonomic groups, nearly 600 species. It's probably over 600, but these are the ones we know about. It's 80% in total that came from the trade. Again, the trade itself isn't a bad activity, but oversight is needed. Proactive oversight, not reactive oversight. Let's talk about the live animal trade. Boy, it's robust. We have a high number of pet shows, expos. We have enthusiasts that love to own exotic, special animal species. That's cool. We're looking at parrots. We're looking at sugar gliders. We're looking at tegu lizards here. These are popular animals in trade. The unfortunate thing is someone may not know that parrot could live 80 years. So they buy it for their kiddo. Their kiddo grows up, goes to college, and then mom and dad are stuck with parrot. Now what? Do they just release it? Sometimes that happens. Do they turn it in? Sometimes that happens. That's actually a good thing. I mentioned we have multiple ports of entry for live cargo. So there's another aspect of management and oversight. Just to give you an idea, when I said there were 180 introduced reptile species, consider that well over 4,000 species of reptiles and amphibians 
are in the trade. Not all of those guys are high risk. So we only need oversight for the ports of entry and the species that we can determine are high risk. Whoa, okay, so how do we do that? Well, first, before we get there, let's discuss what's the risk. The risk is impact. If the species is low risk, it doesn't really have an impact. If it's high risk, it does. So let's talk about those. Remember we discussed ecological, economical, and human health and safety impacts. So I'm gonna highlight some of those ecological impacts. We're talking, they're gobbling up native wildlife. There's a tegu eating eggs from an American alligator or a ground bird nest. They can alter habitat. We know that several burrowing lizard species, think green iguana, they burrow. They can disturb seawalls, roadways, uh, airstrips, uh, water control structures. They can alter not only structure, but habitat, the natural habitat of the Everglades. We have seen destruction of native tree species that fall over because the iguanas have burrowed under them and the ground is disturbed and the trees fall over. That's an example of habitat alteration as well as eco lot or sorry economic alteration. Competition for resources. Trail cams have shown that uh, non-native species like Burmese pythons and um, tegu lizards and green iguanas have outcompeted burrowing owls and our native gopher tortoises for their resources. And of course, there's always that risk of disease and parasitic introduction. Salmonella is a thing. Parasites that Burmese pythons carry have been shown to be able to be transmitted to native snake species. Big, big deals. We discussed some of the economic impacts, damages already. And then of course, there are human health and safety impacts. What I really wanna do with this slide is connect you, your inner mama bear, papa bear response, if you know what I mean. You know that, don't you mess with my kids, I'm going to get mama bear on you. That's the way that I feel when I think about native species, native river otters, native gopher tortoise, native white-tailed deer that's located inside of the stomach of that python in that photo. Native roseate spoonbill, what used to be a roseate spoonbill, uh, is just sitting there in pieces recovered in a necropsy of a python. This is where I find my connection for protecting native wildlife through non-native species management. If I could, I'd channel my inner hippie and just let everything coexist. Unfortunately, as a scientist, I know that that's not possible because of the impacts of invasive species on our native species. My native species are calling to me needing my protection. I'm gonna answer that call. Let's take a look at pythons, for example. In 79 was the first recorded written observation of Burmese pythons in Everglades National Park. Fast forward just those few decades and look at what we have all over South Florida. You can see the original start point of that first 1979 recorded observation, and then the spread, the expansion, and the density that's all over South Florida, the abundance that's all over South Florida is what I should say. And even further north, which are likely escaped or released pets. All of these are credible. These aren't someone thought they saw it. Someone saw it, either took a photo of it, a law enforcement or a biologist, a law enforcement officer or a biologist went out and responded. These are credible, verified sightings. So they extend all the way through our state. The only big factor limiting Burmese pythons from getting that density and abundance further north is temperature. Other non-native reptile species are not so temperature controlled and can establish further north and half. Okay, now. Let's shift gears. You know how they got here. You know why they're a threat. What are we doing about it? And what do you need to know about it? So this is very interesting. And this is where I find there's a big gap between what the FWC does and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to message to the general public and what their level of understanding is. So I wanna help. I wanna make it simple and clear. So let me try. When we talk about regulation for animals, well, everything in Florida is captive that is captive is regulated. So let's do classifications. Let's do class one, two, and three, just to give you an overview. You don't have to remember this and you don't have to memorize it. Class one, lion, similar 
uh, and similar species. Class one, very high risk of death. Lion, bear, um, let's see, what else? Um, hippo. These are dangerous, high level animals, high risk if it got out to human health and safety. Class two, still large animals, alligator, some uh, serval cats, damage to human, yes. Mm, some risk of death, definitely risk of injury. So class two. And then class three, low risk, still some risk, but low risk. Most of our um, popular exotics in the trade, like a sugar glider, that's a class three. A capybara, class three. So you can see kind of the way the classifications are here. Everything that's held in captivity from a lion in a zoo to somebody's pet capybara, all of these things are regulated, but not everyone knows that and not everyone is able to qualify and get the proper permit or licensing for these things. Additionally, a lot of enthusiasts like to keep venomous species. Well, gosh, with venom, that's a whole other set of regulations and classifications. So venomous species have their own category in, re in rule, in regulation. All you need to know, the take home message of this slide is, if you're gonna keep something non-native as a pet or for commercial sale or for public education exhibition, you should be aware that there are restrictions on what you can bring in the state. And you may need a license or a permit just to possess it for any of those purposes. And this is what we're trying to message to the public. We're not trying to get rid of anything. We're not trying to be mean. What we're trying to do is say, is it safe for you to have this? Will your caging be up to snuff? And can you prove that the species you wanna bring in isn't a high risk to our state? Okay, now, there's a couple more layers to this regulatory structure. And this is where my program is involved. And this is very interesting because it involves everything else we're gonna talk about today. So let's just take a moment and try to process through two more categories. All of the previous categories we looked at for captive wildlife involve risk to human health and safety. Now, let's look at risk to ecology and economy. So we're gonna just do two categories. We're gonna talk about conditional and prohibited. First, before we do that, what does it mean if it's conditional, if it's prohibited? What can I do, what can I not do? Let's, let's go through. If I have a conditional species like a red-eared slider, isn't that the cutest little baby turtle? And this is how they get sold. They get sold when they're about the size of a little teeny tiny thing, like just a dime almost. <laughs> they're so cute when they're this size. Unfortunately, what happens is that this species grows. It's gonna end up being bigger than a dinner plate. The filtration required and the tank space required, plus the longevity, they can live 35 years, this causes some pet owners, some sellers, whoever, to decide I can't do this anymore and they dump them. Or they may have had them in outdoor ponds and there wasn't a proper barrier around the pond and this species got out. This is a species that has ecological impacts. It can outcompete our native turtles. It can do a host of other things. I wanna save time here, but you get the idea. That's why this particular reptile needs regulatory status. So it's conditional. You need a permit to possess one as a pet. Sure, you can have it as a pet, but you best have the permit and the proper caging to support that pet. So you can have it as a pet. Well. This says you can't, sorry, sorry, sorry. Conditional species other than red-eared sliders can't be possessed as pets. Red-eared sliders are a very special exception and that's why I wanted to mention them today. I want to make it easier for people to get that permit, but also to know everything else that's conditional, you can't possess it. For a long time, for example, Burmese pythons were conditional for the last 10 years. No one could have them as a pet. You also would need permits to do all those other activities. Let's try and clear the air and make it easier to understand. Prohibited species are an additional layer of regulatory structure. So if you had an anaconda, a reticulated python, something that 
clearly represented an ecological impact. If that were to get out and establish, we'd have Burmese Python the sequel on our hands. We don't want that. So you can't have a prohibited species as a pet and you can't import and possess it for the purposes of commercial sale. You would need very strict permits to exhibit it or research any of these species. In summary, there's a high level of regulation on species, yet, huh, we still get species introduced every year through accidental escape or intentional release. In order to fix that, we need to raise public awareness, not just why can't I have this? Why can't I do what I want with it? We need to raise awareness of the impacts and why it's a serious issue and why our agency is so conservation focused. So there's a lot of challenge in the messaging and making sure that we work with stakeholders to um, get their feedback, get their input and try to come up with rules that make sense. So highlighting conditional real quick, in general, unless it's a red-eared slider pictured here, no personal possession is a pet and you would need permits to do everything else. And then of course, there are inspections. You gotta get your caging inspected and, and the biosecurity and all that goes through it. Prohibited species, just to review, things like Gambian pouched rats and piranhas. Nobody can own those. You can't have that as a pet. You can't sell it. You can't import it. And you would need high level permits to exhibit and research it. So again, this high level of rule causes problems because people get scared. The general public goes, wait a minute, I've had a Gambian pouched rat as a pet, just for example. Probably nobody does, but if they did, oh my gosh, I've had this rat for 10 years. I didn't know it was a prohibited species. Are they gonna come kill it? Am I gonna have to pay a fine? Will I be arrested? Fear, fear is a driving factor behind release. Oh, excuse me. So anytime we go through a rule change, we're aware that there might be fear and there might be illegal dumping of species. Let me give you an example. In 2021, the green iguana went through a big, rule change. What do I mean by that? They used to be regulated as class three. Remember that was the capybara class. That was the probably can't kill you, probably not gonna do so much damage to you. And you didn't even need a license or a permit to possess it as a pet. So that species, the green iguana, went from being very lowly regulated to very highly regulated as a prohibited species in 2021. It happened in April and what it required was that anybody that was in possession, it's okay, calm down. All you have to do is apply for a free permit. We'll give you a free pit tag. We held several events to do that. And you do have to update biosecurity to come into compliance with the new rules. And it prevented anyone from acquiring new green iguanas. And there were a couple of exceptions to the rule. There were a few, you know, a handful of entities that could still possess and do things. But what we're trying to do is limit anyone that was in possession for importation, breeding, commercial use. So very, very few entities qualified to continue that activity. And then we had to educate people on what you can still do with them and not do with them. A lot of people want to remove them. A lot of homeowners see green iguanas not as a pet and not as a commercial product, but as a nuisance in their neighborhoods. There are trappers that you can hire to remove them and homeowners need to be educated on what they can and can't do with iguanas. So they're not protected by any law except anti-cruelty. That's important. You can't go out and torture an iguana just because it's a prohibited species. It's non-native, it's invasive. We want it out of Florida. That doesn't mean you can go out and do something like chemically poison or drown an iguana. People have tried to do that, unfortunately. So removal is allowed on private property. If you're the landowner, you can remove, you can shoot it, you can do anything that's legal, you can trap it and kill it yourself. You can also remove non-native species similar to green iguanas and green iguanas on 25 different lands. We have hunting enthusiasts that are, are interested in the um, appeal of hunting exotic species. This is one that is legal for them to remove and it benefits the state, it benefits our native wildlife if hunters are interested in going out 
members of the public can publicly can go out to public lands and remove. They don't need a permit. They don't need a license. And all they have to do is humanely kill the animal on site. It's now prohibited. They can't put it in a cage and live transport it over to Zoo Miami and try to drop it off. That's not going to work. Zoo Miami doesn't want it, I promise you. So trappers are able to do this and trappers can get special permits. They can do certain things, but it's important for people to know what they can and can't do. And let me give an example of why this is important for the messaging, for those going out hunting to be responsible. Law enforcement in a South Florida county got a call, and this has happened multiple times, of someone near a school with a rifle. Can you imagine? That's a real threat these days. It's on the news every day, school shootings. It feels like it's on the news every day. So this is a problem, clearly. And the person was not a threat to the school, as it turned out. They were hunting iguanas on the adjacent property to the school, and they had permission from the landowner to do it. So is that activity legal? Yes. Would it have been better if that hunter had checked in with local law enforcement, maybe worn a vest or some type of identifier, you can see the messaging that we need to go through. So my job is to make the public aware of what they can do and can't do. Many people are like me. They, they channel their inner hippie and they don't want iguanas removed. They think they're beautiful. I think they're beautiful species too, but I also am aware as a scientist of their impacts to our native species and the ecology and economy of our state. And I know they can't be allowed to stay. So it's a balance, right? It's difficult. Imagine how easy it is to get people involved in manatee research and rescue. Everybody loves a manatee. What a charismatic animal. Iguanas aren't the same way. In fact, most non-native species aren't the same way. So we have to talk about uncomfortable topics. If folks have the stomach to go out and want to remove iguanas, we have to talk about what trap is appropriate. What can you do and not do? I would not necessarily recommend a snare pole, like something that can uh, close around a, a, a limb or the tail. It's very messy and it's probably gonna cause the animal some distress. I would recommend a net or a trap. Then the animal can be humanely killed quite quickly. And of course, if you're talking about humane killing, that's a good thing. So you want to treat that animal with respect. Um, but snare poles, nets and traps are all legal. So it's good to know. What's not legal? The old bear traps, the claw traps, body gripping steel leg hold traps. Mm -mm. None of that is legal. Any type of poison, any type of chemical that drives an iguana out of a burrow, out of a tree, smoke even, none of that is legal. So remember, the animals, even if they're non-native, even if they're invasive and they have an impact to our state, they are still protected by anti-cruelty law. I respect Florida for doing that. When we're talking about trapping, members of the public should be aware of what bait works and kind of doesn't work. The iguanas in particular and a lot of non-native lizards don't like citrus. Some non-native lizards prefer eggs, for example. And it's important to note that traps can get bycatch. So if I'm trapping an iguana, what if a raccoon goes in the trap instead? I am required by law to check my traps every 24 hours. Traps have to be set in shade. If you're going to cover them for shade, they need to be covered with breathable material so that when the animal is trapped, it's not suffering. And in 24 hours, either the bycatch is going to be released by the person managing the trap or that animal will be put out of its misery and humanely killed. So these are just some of the example topics that we have to address. We can't gloss over them. We have to talk to the public about them and educate them on what we're doing and why we're doing it. It's also important, and I think a lot of the public finds this topic very interesting, it's important to know that they cannot be relocated. So if I'm a homeowner down in West Palm, for example, and I've got iguanas on my property and I'm like, I don't have the stomach to kill them. That's not my wheelhouse. I, I just, that's not who I am. That's okay. But what you can't do is trap it and then drive it down to the Everglades and release it. That's illegal. You cannot do that. It is illegal to relocate and introduce non-native species into any area of Florida. When you capture an iguana, there is a requirement to humanely kill it on site. So, wow, hang on. If I'm a homeowner or if I have permission from the landowner and I set out traps, I have to kill it? 
Yeah, you do. If you don't want to do that, then you need to hire somebody to do that. So it's important to discuss these nuances of invasive species removal and when the FWC will come out and respond. I'll talk about that in just a second. Just a summary, when we're talking about for example, iguanas or any other non-native species that's out there, Burmese pythons, Nile monitors, tegu lizards, those are some of the high priority species our agency is concerned about. All those species, every wildlife species, native or non-native, is protected in Florida by that anti-cruelty statute. The euthanasia methods must be legal and humane. What that means is, yes, they must be humane, no torture, no chemical, no bleeding it to death, nothing like that, no drowning. But what it also means is that if you're using a firearm, you need to know if it's legal for you to use the firearm on that property or in that city or in that county, you need to know all poisons, no poisons, sorry, no poisons are legal for use on iguanas or any reptiles in Florida. And you must humanely kill any trapped non-native species on site or you need to be able to call a wildlife trapper, a professional trapper. Now, this is my favorite part. And this is pretty much where we're gonna end our program today, just a couple more slides. But I wanted to talk to you quickly about the exotic pet amnesty program. When we talk about making these big rules, and we've done all the science research, we've done the risk assessment and said, this species is low risk, this species is high risk, and it needs to be regulated. So here's examples. You've got a Burmese python on the screen. That's a high risk species, and it is highly regulated. It's prohibited in the state of Florida. Now you've got a bearded dragon in the bottom shot. So that's low risk. That's class three. You don't need a pet permit or a license to possess a beardy as a pet. They make great pets. I think they're really cute. But we also don't want bearded dragons to get out and established in Florida either. So it's just something to, to balance, right? It's just something to consider. What's low risk? What's high risk? And when you make regulations, are you going to scare everybody into dumping their animals? That's what happened way back in 2006. The dumping, no. The, the worry over rule and scaring people happened in 06. There were a couple of large constrictors like Burmese pythons that were going into a rule change. And they were so popular in the trade and a lot of people had them. And the thought was, gosh, if we make these strong rules and we list these species highly regulated, will people freak out and just dump them? What if we gave them legal amnesty? What if we said, it's okay, we'll forgive you? That's what this program is all about. And it's my favorite program and I supervise it. It means there's no legal penalty. You could have kept a highly regulated species for 20 years. Nope, no problem, no problem, it's okay. We'll take it, we'll rehome it for you. We're not gonna kill it and you're not in trouble. And there's no fee and you don't have to pay anything. We're gonna do this for you for free. It's such a cool program. It is the legal alternative to pet release. Our program is actually written into Florida rule and that's why we can grant amnesty. Since we started in 06, we've rehomed well over 6,000 animals that have been surrendered. I, that's a strong word. We get requests to rehome. I don't want people to think that we are law enforcement and that we're gonna come kill their pet. That doesn't happen. Literally somebody just calls us up and says, hey, I have a beardy, I need to rehome it. Great, you don't even need amnesty. That's not a regulated species, but we're gonna rehome it for you anyway, and we'll find you a local adopter. We do year round operations. Every day you can call that hotline. Every day you can email our pet amnesty email account. And we're there to answer questions. We work eight to eight to five, Monday through Friday, but those accounts, those hotlines are open every single day. And of course you may be familiar with pet amnesty day events. Those got halted during COVID. We're gonna bring them back. It's just taking time. We lost some staff. So it just takes time to get those organized. The other thing that's important for the public to do is to note that they're not required to trap species and kill species. That's not something that sounds fun to me. I'm a scientist. I have to do it per my job. 
But if I was a homeowner, I don't know if I'd have the stomach for it. So that's okay. What you can do is give us data. You can help us by reporting non-native species observations to the hotline, to the smartphone app, to the website. And what really helps are credible report elements like a quality in focus, high definition photo and the location, the exact location and the date, the time where it was seen. So if I get a report that a Burmese python is in a tree down near Miami and I drive all the way down to Miami and unfortunately it's a vine, you know what would have helped? That quality photo. <laughs> That would have helped save me a trip down through Miami traffic, right? And it would have helped to identify exactly what species it was. Is it an Eastern indigo snake? I'm probably not going to respond to that. That's a native snake and I want to protect that snake. Is it a Burmese python? Yes, that's a high priority response. So one small caveat to finish us up here. When I mentioned like green iguanas, I don't need a homeowner in Miami to call me and say there's a green iguana in my backyard because I already know that. That's their established range. So knowing the, the established range of the species and going, huh, well, that shouldn't be here. You know, that's very helpful. Can you imagine how many seasonal or tourist um, personnel that we have that come into the state and they may not know that iguanas exist. They may have never seen an iguana for the first time. They may be reporting. So it's great that we can spread the word on what's established, what's not, what's invasive, what's not. You can see how all these terms come together in the end and outreach and education is a huge part of what we do. So with that, I think I'm out of time. I'm gonna stop and take questions. All right. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, so if you guys do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and then I can help relay. And if there's anything you want to know about FWC in general, other programs that we do, definitely not my wheelhouse, but I can point you in the right direction. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I think the we get calls all the time, basically every single day here at South Florida Wildlife Center of people wanting to surrender pets. So the amount of times that we have referred over to the pet amnesty program is numerous. It's just such a great program that I think is amazing for the state of Florida. I do too. In my mind, it's the crown jewel of the non-native program. <laughs> and what we've been trying to do, if I, if I may, what we've been trying to do in the last couple of years is really increase our doctor recruitment. So our program is literally a matchmaking service because we're not what you guys are at the South Florida Wildlife Center. You have a brick and mortar building with veterinary care. You have staff and volunteers wonderful staff and volunteers that come in and provide care for the species in-house. We don't have that. We are a virtual entity. We're a virtual version. When someone surrenders or requests to rehome an animal with us, they are doing that virtually. So let's say that my best friend, Sarah, is at home with her bearded dragon and decides this is too much. I can't. That's okay. Sarah can request a rehome through us. So she picks up the phone or she shoots us a little email and she calls us. What we're going to do is say, we're going to tell her, Sarah, okay, we've received your request. Hang on to your beardy. Give me a couple of days, maybe a week or two. And we're going to send an email blast out to all of our adopters in the state. Some are going to be local. Some are going to be further away. We'll start local first. And then if we don't get any nibbles on this adoption, we'll expand our range and we can go statewide if we need to. And then we'll get people that respond and say, hey, yeah, I want that bearded dragon. That'd be great. And then we put that owner, Sarah, and that new adopter in contact. We match them. And then they go, hey, when can I come get it? And we'll arrange all the transfer. So we are literally a matchmaking service. Unfortunately, that's the hardest part for our um owners to understand we're not the best fit when someone needs to rehome an animal tomorrow. And there are species that take far, far longer than days or weeks. Red-eared sliders, that turtle we were talking about, that species can take a year or more. 
we just don't have any adopters that are permitted or even want them because their care is so intense. Mm -hmm. So it's a difficult, difficult challenge. And what we love to do is pitch anytime we can their little sales pitch of you can become an adopter and there's no obligation to join the program. All that means is that you're going to get emails if someone surrenders a species that you've said you're interested in. So if you didn't say sulcata tortoise, you won't get any emails for a sulcata tortoise. If you said sugar glider, when we rarely do get sugar, sugar gliders, and we do, when if you say sugar glider, we're going to email you about sugar gliders. And we'll only do it in the county that you specify. So if you're in Broward and you want sugar gliders that are located in Broward and not in orange <laughs> miles away, sure, we can set up your profile like that. So we're very generous in that fact, but what we want people to do is consider, could they be an adopter? Could they be a temporary foster? That's allowed as well, as long as the species isn't regulated. So if there's no permit or license required, you can be a temporary housing unit for these species and, and you can be part of this great conservation story. When I get that call, the last thing I want to do is go out and kill anything that I don't have to. And this program allows us to be so passionate to preserve that non-native life that was kept as a pet mm -hmm. and to protect native species by placing that non-native life, that pet somewhere else so that it doesn't accidentally escape or that owner gets so backed into a corner that they just chuck it into the Everglades. We wanna prevent that owner from doing that. So consider, if you will, becoming an adopter for our program. And if you have any questions, I can always answer email and walk you through it. <laughs> Awesome. So I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and make myself big again. <clears throat> Thank you again so much, Jan, for sharing all about that amazing program. And for all of you that did attend live, I will be posting this replay onto our YouTube channel. So if there's anything that you want to refer back to that Jan mentioned, the information will be there so you can refer back to it as long as you want to. Um, Again, thank you guys so much for joining us today. If you are not familiar with our social media channels, South Florida Wildlife Center does have an Instagram, a Facebook, a TikTok, and then of course our YouTube. So feel free to stay up to date on that. We will be having our virtual wild lecture series every month and we have a lot of amazing speakers just like Jan planned for the rest of the year. So stay up to date, go visit our website and you guys can see all of our upcoming events. Thank you again so much, Jan and everyone that attended today and everyone that's watching the replay. Thank you and we hope that you have a great rest of your day. Bye everybody. Bye, thank you.